Hello, everyone, and welcome back to SALT Talks. My name is John Darcy. I'm the Managing Director of SALT, which is a global thought leadership forum and networking platform at the intersection of finance, technology, and public policy. SALT Talks are a digital interview series with leading investors, creators, and thinkers. And our goal on these SALT Talks is the same as our goal at our SALT conferences, which we're excited to resume here in September of 2021. Registration just opened uh, last Tuesday, so we're excited to resume those conferences. But our goal is to provide a window into the mind of subject matter experts, as well as provide a platform for what we think are big ideas that are shaping the future. And we're very excited today to welcome Ambassador Kenneth Juster to SALT Talks. Uh, Ambassador Juster recently completed his service as the 25th U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of India. He previously served in the U.S. government as Deputy Assistant to the President for International Economic Affairs on both the National Security Council and National Economic Council, starting in 2017, under the Secretary of Commerce from 2001 to 2005. Uh, he was a counselor, acting counselor of the State Department from 1992 to 1993, and Deputy and Senior Advisor to the Deputy Secretary of State, Lawrence Eagleburger, from 1989 to 1992. Uh, as Under Secretary of Commerce, he co-founded the U.S. India High Technology Cooperation Group, uh, and he was a key architect of the Next Steps in Strategic Partnership Initiative between the United States and India. In the private sector, uh, Ambassador Juster has been a partner at the global investment firm Warburg Pincus uh, from 2010 to 2017 a senior executive at Salesforce.com from 2005 to 2010, and a senior partner at the law firm Arnold and Porter. Hosting today's talk is Anthony Scaramucci, who's the founder and managing partner of Skybridge Capital, which is a global alternative investment firm. Anthony's also the chairman of SALT. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anthony for the interview. Uh, John, thank you. Ambassador, before I get started, John and I look like we're in hostage videos. <laughs> and there you are with this beautiful background. And so tell us, what that background represents. Where is that in India? And what is that beautiful building behind you, sir? Well, actually, it's just my backyard uh, in uh, <laughs> Westchester, New York. Now, seriously, <laughs> this is uh, one of, it's called the Water Palace uh, Jal Mahal in Jaipur, India. It's one of the, the many beautiful places to visit if you come to India. Uh, and I thought it was a Nice background, given that I had served for about three years and three months as ambassador uh, to that great country. And it's uh, one of the more beautiful countries in the world. Before I get into your ambassadorship, however, I want to talk a little bit about your background. Where, where did you grow up, sir? What led you into public service? What did your career look like before you became the, amb the U.S. ambassador to India? Well, first of all, by the way, let me tell you, it's a real pleasure to be with you here today, uh, Anthony. I thank you for that question. Uh, I was born in Manhattan, but grew up in Westchester and Scarsdale, New York, graduated from Scarsdale High School, uh, always had an interest in uh, government and international affairs. Uh, after college, I did a joint degree in both uh, the Kennedy School of Government as well as the law school at Harvard, uh, and first served in government uh, with one of my professors, Sam Huntington, at the National Security Council in the late 70s, uh, and that got me even more excited in working in the uh, government and in foreign policy, went down to Washington as a practicing lawyer after a clerkship for a year at one of the large international law firms. And then uh, one of the clients I worked with, Larry Eagleburger, became a deputy secretary of state. I was a junior partner. He asked me to come in uh, to the government to work with him. That was a incredible period of time. In 1989, you had the Tiananmen Square, you had the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the unification of Germany, the Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I worked with a wonderful team of people, and it really sold me on the possibilities of having a career where, as you can in our country, move in and out of government. I got to serve again in 2001 to 2005 as an Undersecretary of Commerce uh, in charge of issues where business and national security intersected. Uh, and then in 2017, I had not been involved in the uh, campaign for the presidency, but uh, when the Trump administration won, they did not have a deep team at that point. And I was asked uh, by uh, Gary Cohn, who had been the number two person at Goldman Sachs, to join him at the White House as the person in charge of international economic affairs at both the National Security Council and National Economic Council. 
Uh, I did that, and then shortly thereafter, the opportunity to uh, potentially be ambassador to India opened up. My name was uh, raised, and I was uh, very fortunate to be nominated and confirmed for that position later in 2017. You know, it, listen, it's a great life story, and obviously, thank you for your service. I want to step back a second for some of the Americans that listen to us here on Salt Talks that may not know as much about India as you do. And I want you to tell us the story of India, uh, where India fits into the whole economic system, uh, the geopolitical system. Why should U.S. citizens uh, be concerned about our, our relationship with India? Well, India became independent in uh, August of 1947. At the time, there was the partition of India and Pakistan. And it was a leader, a B leader, really, of the non-aligned movement during the Cold War. Uh, despite being in the non-aligned position, uh, over time, it uh, tilted somewhat toward the Soviet Union in terms of supplying its weaponry and military equipment, in part because the United States also tilted toward Pakistan. The U.S. was still involved uh, with India, often in an uh, area of developmental assistance, agricultural assistance, and the like. Uh, but the relationship was not particularly close. Uh, uh, with the end of the Cold War, obviously, the Soviet Union uh, disbanded. Uh, you were starting to see uh, immigration uh, from uh, India to the United States and the beginning of an Indian-American uh, population. I mean, it existed before then, but it really began to take off more. India then tested some nuclear weapons uh, in 1998 and received uh, from the United States and other countries a severe sanctions for doing so. No, but at the end of his uh, President Clinton's term, he took a trip to India and really tried to uh, warm up the relationship. There was still the nuclear issue that was uh, of concern. And when President George W. Bush came into office in 2001, he and the Indian Prime Minister Vajpayee at that time really felt that the world's oldest democracy United States and the world's largest democracy, India should have a better uh, relationship. As you may also recall, India, Indian companies and individuals have been involved in the Y2K fix. Uh, so Americans were increasingly exposed uh, to India. And that really began the transformation of the relationship. I was fortunate to be involved because one of the things that India was interested in was access to uh, sensitive U.S. technology to help its uh, economic sector, its uh, civilian space sector, its civilian uh, defense sector, or civilian military, uh, or not, I shouldn't say civilian military, but uh, uh, military sector to a, to a certain degree as well. And uh, I was uh, at the intersection of those issues and so became involved in this transformation of the uh, relationship. India is not an ally of the United States, it's not an adversary, but it's an increasingly important strategic partner. And as we have now focused more attention on the region that's known as the Indo-Pacific, and where really the center of gravity of international affairs is moving, the U.S.-India relationship is a major pillar of uh, hopefully stability and prosperity uh, in that region. So we've really had an increasingly close relationship over the last 20 years, and it's been bipartisan, uh, and it's uh, had the support of parties uh, across the uh, aisles in both countries, and uh, each administration is built on the successes of the previous one. And of course, we have our tension now with China, uh, and China and India obviously have their issues. Explain that triangle to people that are perhaps not as familiar with it. Well, first of all, India is in a very different geographical and historical position than the United States. China is on its northern border and it stretches very far and it's a border that still remains uh, undefined. Uh, and uh, India and China have a relationship that goes back thousands of years, but they did have a war in 1962 uh, relating to the border issues. And they've tried to manage the relationship since then. They've had a series of agreements and protocols as to how to uh, deal with border matters. Uh, they've interacted increasingly economically. But in the last several years, the Chinese have continued to be uh, sort of aggressive on the northern border. Uh, in 2017, they occupied territory in what's called Doklam, which is an area 
where India, China, and Bhutan meet. And then in 2020, they amassed uh, 50,000 troops on the northern border. And so that has really raised uh, concerns in India and I think shattered a certain degree of trust that the Indians had with the Chinese. Certainly the border issue, which had been compartmentalized and kept separate from the rest of the relationship, has now uh, undercut the relationship. India is trying to disentangle itself somewhat from its economic relationship with China, certainly in, in the area of technology. And so it's a, it's a very sensitive dynamic in that region. And you really have China, India, and Pakistan, three nuclear uh, countries, uh, all next to each other. And it's a very uh, potentially dangerous area of the world, but also one that uh, with the world's largest populations and large economies and a tremendous amount of international trade, a very dynamic and critical region. So I, want, I want you to react to this, Ambassador, The uh, and these are perceptions, and perhaps some of these perceptions are not factual, so clear it up for me if uh, they're perceptions. Um, but I would, I would say in general, American business leaders, uh, we view our relationship with China as competitive, somewhat adversarial. There are politicians that would take it a step further and say that those tensions are uh, on the edge there, if not uh, the beginnings of a Cold War. Um, and there's some, some imperial fears related to China. However, there doesn't seem to be those fears related to India. Uh, I want you to react to that. Did I get any of that right? Or uh, what is the reality on the ground? Well, the Chinese have a very different form of government than India. It's an autocracy. And Chinese behavior in recent years has been increasingly expansionist in that region, the South China Sea, uh, directed toward countries in Southeast Asia, the East China Sea against India, uh, on the Indian, against the Japan, I'm sorry, on the northern border with India. Uh, in Bhutan, they've been aggressive. Uh, they've really infiltrated in many ways countries of South Asia. They've obviously, in their own uh, area, uh, been increasingly aggressive in, uh, against Taiwan uh, with uh, Hong Kong. And so uh, this has gotten the attention and concern of a uh, country in the region. India is a democracy. It has not indicated or exhibited expansionist uh, behavior. It's a fascinating country that's incredibly diverse. It's really many countries rolled up into one, but it's a country that we share many values with. There's a tremendous people-to-people -people relationship. There are approximately 4 million Indian Americans in the United States. Uh, there's constant travel back and forth between the two countries. We uh, processed over 1 million visas a year uh, from India, over 200,000 Indian students. Uh, go to the United States to get educated. So it's a very different relationship and it's a country that we want to build a uh, increasing uh, future with in terms of trying to have a stable Indo-Pacific and a more stable uh, world order. And we see India as a key partner uh, in that process. No one wants to have a conflict with China, but it's increasingly a competitive uh, relationship. Prior to your role as ambassador, you were at Warburg Pincus, I think, for six or seven years. Uh, one of your jobs there was to assess geopolitical risk. And so step back for our Salt Talk uh, viewers and listeners and tell us where the geopolitical risks are to the United States and to our industries. Okay, well, this is really a time of great change in the international system. The tectonic plates are moving, uh, led uh, primarily by the rise of China. Uh, I mean, there's always the question of when a uh, new great power rises, can that be done peacefully within the existing international system? Or will that create tensions and potentially even conflict? But the rise of China and uh, uh, the potential uh, concerns that that uh, accompanies that is certainly one of the uh, central geopolitical risks that people need to uh, deal with and focus on. Russia. Uh, has been a revisionist country and is engaged in activity that is increasingly of concern to the United States, to countries in Europe and elsewhere. That's a major risk. I think even in the West, the rise of nationalism, uh, post-COVID-19, a lot of countries are saying, how do we cut our dependencies in other countries? How do we bring back uh, economic activity to our country? What that means for uh, international trade and economic interaction is going to be a, a challenge. 
and really defining the, the, the rules of the road for the world order going forward. Many people would say that the liberal system that developed after World War II is no longer really attuned to today's challenges. And so how do we develop a new system that enhances prosperity and security and hopefully avoids uh, conflict as you have the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and you have a bunch of other challenges in the global commons, such as the pandemic we're dealing with right now. On the, on the flip side, however, there are massive positive technological changes taking place. Uh, we're moving more into renewables. We've got the introduction of 5G and all the massive uh, technological information flow transformation that will take place as a result of that. And of course, in the biotechnological world, we're doing things like mRNA. And so paint a picture for us of how our diplomats can help calm down the world, if you will, relieve some of these tensions so this great prosperity that's ahead for us technologically can, can happen in a peaceful way and also obviously in a deep way economically where we can share it among uh, classes and societies. Well, as you say, technology is truly changing the world and as it penetrates every industry, it can have a very positive impact. But technology misuse can also have a negative impact. Authoritarian governments can use technology to suppress their people. People you can uh, get track of people's privacy and invade that as well. And I think what diplomats can try to do, uh, working hand in hand with the business community, is really develop the rules and standards for the uses of technology. And, and a future uh, economic discussions will have to deal with the digital economy. What do we do in terms of, of fintech, financial technology, to ensure that we can have more transactions, but at the same time that these are secure and don't get infiltrated by people who want ransomware or things of that uh, nature. So technology is neutral. It can have a tremendously positive impact if it's properly administered and regulated. Uh, and hopefully with minimal regulation, but there are certainly important public policy issues of privacy and security, cybersecurity. Uh, but it can be very damaging if because of uh, increased technology, the country can go in and paralyze your infrastructure through uh, attacks on that technology. Uh, I think it's well said, Ambassador. I want to I put your... Uh Economist hat on for a second, get your reaction to this. We were approximately $8 trillion of deficit spending from 1776 to 2008. From 2008 to 2021, in 13 years, we've added about $20 trillion of debt. So we're now clicking at a $28 trillion budget deficit for the United States. So, so we, we've had modern monetary theorists on that are saying not, not to be worried about our $28 trillion deficit. Are you worried about it? Yeah, I'm worried about it for a, a few reasons. First of all, the U.S. economy is the most resilient economy in the world. Uh, we have a highly entrepreneurial uh, population. We are able to raise capital and uh, deploy it uh, very Quickly, people are high risk takers uh, and can get rewarded for that. And so I think the U.S. economy will do quite well. And uh, even in this situation post-COVID, I think people have been impressed at how quickly it is recovering. So we need still targeted safety nets and potentially stimulus, but I worry that we've overdone it. And as a consequence, uh, you have a lot of money in the financial system that can lead to inflation which will not be beneficial for anybody. Uh, that can also uh, lead to higher taxation to support all of the spending, which will, I think, stifle economic growth. And finally, uh, all of this uh, deficit spending will be a, a real burden on future generations where they're gonna have to spend a lot of their budgets to repay uh, the lending. So I think, uh, uh, as you say, we have uh, seen a tremendous amount uh, of uh, new uh, spending in the last several years and deficit spending, and it is troubling. And I hope that it doesn't uh, really become a drag on the economy, which otherwise I think would be very dynamic in this country. Uh, yeah, listen, I, I, I don't know. I got trained in economics 35 years ago. 
I'm worried about it. I'm being told not to be worried about it. I wanted to get your reaction to all of it. You know, I think intuitively you have to think about your own household. Would you be comfortable if you had that much debt running your own expenses? And the country is made up of uh, a lot of households. And so I think it does raise serious uh, concerns. And we've really broken through barriers that years ago we never anticipated we'd even be reaching. Well, and, and we've had we we had uh, long term thinking back in the day, and we had people that were you know you know I just read uh, Hitchcock's book on uh, Dwight Eisenhower, talking about how seriously he took that budget and how sharp he was with a pencil. It seems now that we're 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 over promising and under delivering, at least in the, in that category. But I want I want to I want to switch gears for a second, and ask your opinion of Russia. Because of your experience in the diplomatic corps, but also your experience as a world leader and uh, uh, an investor, uh, give us your uh, synopsis of where we are with Russia and where do you see Russia in terms of its geopolitical footprint? Well, after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, there were great hopes that Russia could be integrated into uh, the West. and. Uh, That process, unfortunately, uh, uh, has not worked uh, successfully. And I think uh, Putin uh, represents, uh, in many respects, someone who bemoans the uh, collapse of the empire that Russia had developed through the Soviet Union. And he has become, over time, an increasingly revisionist leader. And Russia has uh, engaged in a whole range of behavior that's increasingly troubling. And it almost seems as if they're a modus operandi is to probe and do things that they feel are just under the threshold that will get a major reaction from the United States uh, and other countries. Yes, we'll impose sanctions, but we don't really uh, put a red line down and say this is unacceptable and we're going to reverse the behavior. And the challenge for the United States working with its European allies is not to want to uh, create a conflict with Russia, but to make very clear that there's conduct that's not acceptable and that this process of uh, probing and doing things that are increasingly uh, uh, against the interests of the United States and Europe, including cyber attacks, including interfering with elections, including the activity uh, in Ukraine and elsewhere, this has got to come to a stop. And that's really one of the major challenges uh, for the Biden administration, one of the geopolitical uh, challenges that you mentioned, because if this behavior is allowed to continue, it encourages other countries to engage in that sort of behavior as well. I, I appreciate it, Ambassador. I'm going to I'm going to make sure that John gets some tough questions, like about the Indian Pakistan border, you know, stuff like that. I, I want you to like me, and hopefully, John will say some prickly things, and you'll be annoyed with him. But I have one one last question for you. And that is about our our democracy and the insurrection that took place on January 6th, which uh, unfortunately was my birthday. I was watching, celebrating my birthday and watching a insurrection at the nation's capital. And I feel that the democracy is under threat. And so not to superimpose my ideas on you, what do you feel about this situation? What are your thoughts there, how we can heal the country and possibly try to figure out ways to re-knit the country and unite the country? I think there are several issues that you raise, and I want to try to disaggregate them. I think at the broadest level, in terms of our democracy, I would say much like our economy, it's it's very resilient. We have strong institutions. I've seen around the world countries that don't have institutions that come anywhere close to what we have. We have a strong judiciary. We have a strong uh, media uh, sector. We have a strong civil society. So I don't think that democracy itself in the United States is under threat. What I do think is of concern is that it's increasingly polarized, our political system, and therefore dysfunctional. Now, maybe you could say that makes it under threat. I don't think the system is going to collapse, but I don't think it's working nearly as effectively as it needs to, especially to address the complex challenge that we have. And unfortunately, it sends a negative signal to other countries around the world that democracy is not an effectively functioning system, and it's utilized by countries such as China to say we have a better alternative system, which is sort of state uh, capitalism. So the challenge for us is how do we uh, begin again to work uh, 
uh, as a whole, uh, with uh, people from both sides of the aisle trying to make compromises to advance our interests collectively and to stop enacting uh, legislation that is supported only by one side or the other and then gets reversed a few years later when the other side uh, is uh, uh, controlling the Congress and the executive branch. So the democracy in a broad way, I think, is resilient and still we have stronger institutions than any country in the world. But I do think it's increasingly challenged by the political polarization that has made its implementation uh, less functional than it should be. Well said. Hopefully we can we can get there. Um, uh, but uh, John, let's go here. OK, ask those super tough questions. OK, because what happens to me, Ambassador, is we leave these salt talks. Everybody likes John and they think I'm asking all the tough questions. So come on, John, dig in here, get some spikes in those questions. All right. I'll start with immigration, uh, Ambassador. So I believe there's something around 4 million Indian Americans in the United States. You know, many of them are, are the heads of our major hospital systems or tech companies. You have the heads of, of Google and Microsoft today are Indian Americans. It's obviously been an exchange of people and ideas and commerce between the two nations that has been very fruitful uh, for everyone involved. And I want to talk about the immigration issue a little bit. I think Within the Trump administration, obviously, they they uh, tightened up our immigration policies a little bit. Uh, you know, the Biden administration is still grappling with how to both encourage immigration, but also maintain some control and sovereignty over our borders, frankly. But what is the right immigration policy? Do we have the right immigration policies to continue to attract the best talent uh, from the tech world? And if you were in charge, how would you adjust uh, the current system? Well, first of all, I want to uh, highlight what you said is that uh, Indian Americans that have come to this country have made a great contribution across a whole range of sectors, whether it's been the medical sector, the legal sector, and certainly in the technology uh, sector. And it's, and it's really benefited both countries because it's been a two-way flow of, of, of ideas uh, and of people going back and forth. Uh, many of these uh, Indian uh, Americans have come to the United States through what's called an H-1B visa, which are uh, is a program that began in 1990 to really get uh, high quality people to fill jobs in the technology sector that cannot otherwise be filled by Americans. There are 65,000 slots for H-1Bs and another 20,000 for people who have a master's degree. This is a uh, global program that's open to people from around the world, but the Indians have been able to garner on average about 75% of these visas. That has not changed over time. The H-1B visa program is still in place. It's still 65,000 plus 20,000. It was suspended during the last half of 2020 because COVID had put so many people out of work that there was a sense that we needed to give some priority to Americans, but the program is back uh, in place. And while there have been certain tightenings of uh, the rules and regulations so that you're really getting high quality people and they're not there's not a gaming of the system. It still uh, means that about 70 to 75 percent of the visas go to Indian people. And many of those people then ultimately become uh, U.S. citizens. So I think it's in terms of that policy, it's been a great success. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted that India sends its best people to our country to contribute to our economy. I think the challenge for India is to create conditions in its own countries so that some of these wonderful people want to stay there to develop their career and their entrepreneurship and their innovation rather than contribute to our economy. But the immigration policy that has been relevant to Indian Americans, the H-1B, I think has been a very uh, substantial success. Do you worry at all about what Anthony mentioned earlier, this rise in nationalism and, and populism and some of the polarization that exists in the United States might turn people from somewhere like India off from coming to this country and setting up their business or coming to work in our uh, economy? Uh, do, do you think that issue is in play at all? Yeah, I, I, look, I think that, as I mentioned earlier, is a very important issue, especially coming out of COVID-19. The question is going to be what lessons countries learn from COVID-19. Will it be one of uh, increased nationalism? We need to close our borders. We need to try to develop everything internally. Will the pendulum swing from a very interdependent economic relationship that's existed throughout the world to 
one that tries to cut off uh, dependencies. I think what you really need to do is develop dependencies with trusted partners so that you no country can do uh, things alone. But this sort of nationalism, and we've seen in India uh, what's called self-reliance, and the Indians are quick to say that this does not mean it's going to limit their level of global interaction, but it is saying that we want to be increasingly self-reliant. We want to make sure that supply chains are not dependent on countries that of concern. And so how that will have an impact on India, how some of the concerns in the United States uh, uh, about jobs and security will have an impact still remains to be seen. But the fact is, economic interaction, movement of people, flow of technology, uh, movement of currencies and of uh, uh, capital markets is so integrated uh, internationally that you're not going to be able to turn that back, which is even, by the way, why uh, the relationship with China is very different than what we saw during the Cold War with the United States Soviet Union. The Chinese economy is very much integrated with the rest of the world, so we're going to have to figure out how to manage issues that are of concern rather than think that somehow we're going to be able to uh, disentangle everything and separate it. Right. So uh, several years ago, India is a very cash dominant economy. You probably know the statistics uh, better than I do, but it, I know it's a very cash dominant society. The government went through an experiment several years ago where they tried to basically repatriate a lot of the cash that was on the street and digitize a lot of the economy. How successful were they in that? What did we learn from that experiment? And, and what is the current state of the in Indian economy in terms of modernizing and, and trying to root out what they perceive as, I, I think, non-payment of taxes and, and just an overall archaic uh, infrastructure around their economy? Well, what you're referring to is something known as demonetization, in which on very short notice, uh, all sorts of forms of certain uh, uh, denominations of currency were outlawed. And in hindsight, it created a, a real problem in India because suddenly a lot of uh, people who operated outside the normal economy, but that's how uh, people who uh, work in India often do operate on and at subsistence levels, uh, were suddenly put out of work and uh, their businesses suffered. And so it had uh, substantial uh, downsides. Economically, it was meant to sort of root out corruption. Uh, perhaps it had some positives in that respect. But uh, Clearly, what we've seen is an increasing move uh, to go to more of a digital economy, to be using credit cards and other types of uh, payment systems. And this is happening in India as well. And the whole payments process industry is taking off. Obviously, to the degree things are done that way, it does lessen uh, the possibilities of corruption. And I think this is where the world is going. What it needs to happen now is folks who work in the regulatory area to better understand the ramifications of this and to make sure that it can be done in a way that uh, doesn't allow for laundering of money, for illegal payments, and for other types of issues. But we're all moving in terms of uh, technology transforming the financial sector and trying to do it in a way that will be more efficient for people and and uh, without fraud and corruption and better enable uh, prosperity along the way. So I want to talk about COVID-19 for a second. We obviously over here in the United States saw a lot of horrific stories, you know, the same way we did inside of our own borders about things that were happening related to COVID-19 in India. They had a big wave of infections sort of after things started to die down here in the United States are still working on increasing their vaccination rates. How dire uh, was and is the situation related to COVID-19 in India? And what do you think uh, the country will have learned from, from that period about uh, public health challenges and new healthcare models? Well, let me sort of uh, review what have been two phases, I think, of dealing with COVID-19. Initially, uh, in March of last year, uh, the prime minister imposed a very severe lockdown, maybe the most severe of any major economy in the world other than China, uh, for really it was six weeks, and then it slowly started to be loosened up at state uh, the lockdown more broadly stayed on for a few months. And this uh, serves several purposes. The Indian health system itself is less well developed. There are less beds available per person and other medical supplies than optimally would be the case. And during this initial period, it enabled India to build up its supply of protective equipment, of ventilators, of uh, hospital beds and availability. And so when people started to have COVID symptoms, the healthcare system was able to deal with it without being 
completely overrun. India did have, and given its population, it's a country that's about uh, a third the size of the United States with a population density or with a population about four times our country. So you can imagine how dense it is. They did have a significant number of cases, but were able to manage it. And for whatever reason, there was a lower fatality rate. Some people think because India has perhaps a very young population, 65% of the people are under the age of 35, maybe because people were exposed to SARS in 2003 and had built up immunities to this virus, and maybe because people have just been exposed to other illnesses and have stronger immune systems. For whatever reason, even with a substantial number of cases, there were not as many fatalities. And by the time I left India in January of 2021, the cases had really gone down and things looked like they were in good shape. Unfortunately, I think there was an overconfidence perhaps that uh, the, the COVID problem had been solved and people in the government let their guard down. There were political rallies when there were four major state elections and an election in union territory. So you had hundreds of rallies where people were without masks in close quarters. You had a major religious uh, pilgrimage festivity called the Kumela that was moved up a year from 2022 to 2021, over a million people got together there. And so they suddenly had a spreading uh, and a big second wave. And you saw now new variants, uh, uh, one variant that seems to hit younger people and also spread more rapidly. And there's obviously a concern it could even come to our country. And so India has suffered greatly during the second wave. The numbers, in fact, may well be underreported. And while I think it's plateaued out in the major cities and uh, is getting better, the real concern now is that it's spread to the rural areas where there really is a very uh, poor health infrastructure and that we could see, unfortunately, uh, more tragic deaths uh, along the way. India has, I think, learned a lot. Uh, it had initially been exporting vaccines. It's now trying to focus more on building up its own inventory and getting its own population vaccinated. I still think only about 3% of the population has received two vaccine shots, about 13% of the population has received one, but that's still a substantial way to go uh, for the country. So this right. will continue to be a challenge. Last question I want to ask, ask you, it's about India, Pakistan. So when people go around the world and they try to identify the real hot spots where we could see the potential for armed conflict and potentially nuclear conflict, India, Pakistan seems to be one of the top ones on the list. So how concerned are you about relations between those two countries? Where do they stand today relative to sort of the historical ebbs and flows of tensions between those two countries? And again, how concerned are you about the bubbling up of tensions between India and Pakistan? Well, the relationship between India and Pakistan has always been a difficult one, beginning with partition in 1947. They've had four wars in 47 and 65 and 71 uh, and in 99. And uh, there has been, uh, in recent years, increased cross-border terrorism from Pakistan to India. And this is a area, because you have two nuclear states, that always uh, presents uh, risks. More recently, when India had a further focus on problems in the North with China, their nightmare scenario was that they have a two-front conflict with China in the North and Pakistan in the West, and the Indians and the Pakistanis have been able to reach agreement in February of this year to honor all of the peace and sort of ceasefire arrangements on the line of control that separates uh, the two countries. But they still need to try to work out a better modus operandi and to have economic development. When Prime Minister Modi, and, and economic development in that region, when Prime Minister Modi came into office, he did invite the Indian Prime Minister, the Pakistani Prime Minister to his inauguration. He later visited that Prime Minister on his birthday, and they sought to try to move the, the relationship forward. But then there were some terrorist incidents and it's undercut that. And I really think they need to deal with solving the cross-border terrorism issue to promote greater stability and economic opportunity in that region. But this continues to be a sort an area of tension. The countries uh, do have uh, dialogue and back channel operations to try to keep things under control. But again, something can flare up and uh, lead to a problem. So I think the whole region, as I mentioned earlier, of India, Pakistan, China, is one that the world needs to uh, keep a, a sharp eye on. 
Well, Ambassador Kenneth Juster, thank you so much for joining us here on SALT Talks. I think more than anyone right now uh, in the American power structure, you've done so many things to contribute to this great partnership and friendship between the United States and India that I think will be increasingly important uh, in the years to come. And we have you uh, in part to thank for that, that partnership. So thank you so much for your service. Thanks for joining us on SALT Talks. Anthony, you have a final word for the ambassador before we let him go. Well, look, we want to get you to one of our live events. So we got our next one coming up in September, Ambassador, uh, which will be at the Javits Center. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Anthony and John. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you this morning. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to today's SALT Talk with Ambassador Kenneth Juster. Just a reminder, if you missed any part of this talk or any of our previous SALT Talks, you can access them all on demand on our website at salt.org backslash talks or on our YouTube channel, which is called Salt Tube. We're also on social media. Twitter is where we're most active at Salt Conference. But we're also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook as well. And please spread the word about these Salt Talks if you find them interesting. On behalf of Anthony and the entire Salt team, this is John Darcy signing off from Salt Talks for today. We hope to see you back here again soon.